if you'd be kind enough now, very gently close your eyes, take a deep breath in, and exhale. And another one. And exhale. And we take and visualize and ask for the assistance of the angels, the archangels, the ascended masters, the Reiki masters, but most especially Master Jesus, Master Buddha, Master Katumi, Saint Francis, Saint Germain, Saint Gabriel, Saint Raphael, Saint Michael, the Blessed Mother, the Divine Feminine, Mary Magdalene, Moses, Metatron, Melchizedek, Mohammed, and Kuan Yin. And we ask that we be cleared, centered, aligned, balanced, and grounded and that whatever comes in for us or for our intentions comes in for our highest good. And the intentions that I would like to start with are the ones that my guides have asked me to bring forward. And this is for all new couples, male and female, male together, female together, that are starting a new life in marriage. For everybody that is currently going up the silver cord, because this is the end of their life. For all new souls that are coming down the birth canal and coming to planet Earth, to bring their brand of enlightenment and their special wisdom to the planet, the new life that is coming to planet Earth. For all the groups that are caught in the crosshairs of embattled and groups that are fighting each other, anybody that is out there, any place on planet Earth caught between groups that are battling. For all the people who are caught up in a web of deceit because their culture, their country is being ruled by dictators. And for all those who are fleeing a life of persecution, a life of, of watching innocent people die, innocent people being slaughtered, innocent people being succumbed to do things that terrorize and traumatize them, and all the refugees that are streaming across the world including the ones that are streaming into the United States. We have always been a place of refuge for those from around the world. And may we always continue to be so. And now I would like you to silently add your personal intention. And I would like you to place 
yourself first and foremost. As if you were laying on a table in front of you and all the ascended masters and angels and archangels and Reiki masters are coming in to do the healing on you. So you are there. Your intention is there. And now everybody place, everybody else that's on the screen And so we place each other on the table. Okay. And now I would like to overlay Mother Earth and just visualize our beautiful blue planet in all her potential pristine glory. And as you visualize the planet, just know that the planet encompasses all the other planets in the solar system, as well as all the living beings that we have also mentioned. Yourself, your intentions, the people on the screen, and the list of people that I had brought in. And now we take another deep breath in and exhale. And visualize Helios, our sun, the living creature that our sun is and visualize that the sun is radiating down upon us. And as we open our crown, the thousand petal lotus that sits on top of our head we allow the sun to permeate and bring its life force and incredibly magnificent energy, but even more importantly, its power into us because we know that we too radiate as brightly as the sun. And we allow the rays of the sun to penetrate into our thousand petal lotus, every point of our crown that contains every single virtue, every single piece of us that is tied to the divine, everything we bring forth on this planet that is equated with love is found in our crown. 
it is who we are. The entire benevolent aspects of who we are. And breathe in to the count of four. Again, and exhale to the count of four. Again, exhale, and one last time, and exhale. And now we are going to practice the Merkaba breath. We are going to breathe in to the count of eight, and we are going to take our breath up our spine to the count of eight. At our crown, we pause for four. And we exhale down our front to the count of eight. And we see our crown expanding way beyond the limitation of our physical body. We see our crown effectively expanding through all the dimensions back to God. And we sit in the lap of God. And we bring the light of Helios back into our body. We bring it back from the lap of God. And we take 
the beautiful sun energy and we move it into our brow, into our sixth chakra. And we look at the brow and recognize that it is through our brow that we connect to the ancestors, the guides, the angels, the archangels, the Akashic records. And we have the right to receive all the information that we are ready for. And we have the right to ask for whatever it is that we want to know. And we ask with humility, humbleness, and a sincere desire to understand every facet of ourselves, every facet of us as a spiritual being having a human experience. And we also know that through our brow, through our third eye, we can also travel interdimensionally. We can leave to other places, other planets, other universes, other solar systems, anything and everywhere. Nothing is denied us. It is up to our imagination as to where we want to go and what we want to do. And now we're going to breathe again to the count of four and we'll breathe the energy from the root into the crown. One, exhale, again, exhale, Again, exhale, and one more time. Exhale. And now we'll practice the Merkaba breath. We breathe to the count of eight and we breathe on the outside of our spine. Pause for four. And exhale to the count of eight. And as we expand our brow, we know that everything, everything that we wish to know is inside of us. Nothing is denied us. It is our own curiosity. 
that leads us to new places. And we know that we have this magnificent group of guides, of high spiritual beings that are willing to and do accompany us on our journey through planet Earth. We are never alone. We always are guided. And now we move Helios, the beautiful ball of sun energy into our throat. And we see our throat expand and expand and expand and we see that if we've been carrying any constrictions in our throat any inability to speak our truth anything that we feel that blocks us, the light of the sun can dissolve those blocks. And we take the powerful light of Helios to effectively melt any barriers, any shackles, any barricades that we have erected in our throat. And we ask that our divine truth be in complete alignment with our physical truth. Our divine truth be in alignment with our personal truth, the third chakra, because the third chakra and the fifth chakra are linked together. The fifth is your divine I am. The third is your personal I am, your personality I am. And now we breathe to the count of four. And exhale. Again. Exhale. Again, exhale, and one last time, and exhale. And now we practice the Merkaba breath. We take our breath outside our spine and move it up to the count of eight.
we pause for four. And we exhale for eight. And we also watch as Helios helps to expand our throat to its fullness, its ability to be the creative force in our life its ability for us to bring forth what it is that we wish to create however we want our life to show up for us. And nothing is off the table. It doesn't matter what you ask for. No that it, if it is within your soul contract, you will get it. And now we bring the light of Helios into our heart. And we feel the intense heat of the radiant sun heal any facets of our heart, whether our heart feels broken or torn or confused or abandoned or relegated to a place that feels like a very dark, deep, dreary place for us. We ask that Helios come in and radiate its magnificent light into all facets of our Heart, so that our heart can glow with the most magnificent healing light of both green for healing, St. Raphael's light, or pink for tenderness and love and compassion, we ask that Helios help our heart to send forth the rays from within that are the most beneficial, not only for ourselves, but for everyone else that we touch, everyone else that we go and have an experience with. And we ask that we truly understand what it means to be heart-centered. And now we breathe in to the count of four. Exhale. Again. Exhale. 
exhale. Again. Exhale. And one last time. Exhale. And now we breathe in to the count of eight up our spine. We pause for four and we exhale for eight. And now we move Helios into our solar plexus. And as we watch the brilliant light of the sun increase our solar plexus, we realize that we have much work to do on this planet. And we have the help of all the spiritual beings that flood us, flood into our energy field. And we bring the light of Helios into the brilliant yellow ball that the solar plexus exhibits and the yellow color that exists in our mental body. And we see that the colors are almost identical. There's very little difference between the radiant light of Helios and the yellow light of the solar plexus. And this helps us understand our humanity as well as our divinity. And this helps us accept our humanity in light of our divinity. We are human, but we are divine.
and we exhibit the characteristics of a divine being at all times that our awareness takes us there. We recognize that there is not the limitation that society places on us. There is not the limitation that our culture, our religions, our friends, our family may place on us. And we realize we are unlimited in every aspect, in every respect. We do not have to bow to limitation from anyone, anything, any place. It is totally up to us to decide what it is that we wish to experience for ourselves and to then make that possible for ourselves. And now we breathe in to the count of four. Again, exhale, again, exhale, and one last time, exhale. And now we breathe in to the count of eight. Pause for four. Exhale to the count of eight. And now we take the light of Helios, the light of our magnificent sun, and we move him into our solar plexus. I'm sorry, into our sacral. And this is the place that we have where we gestate our great ideas and we bring new life, not only in human form, but the life that is going to, the life that is going to increase the ability of man to take care of himself in a way that does not harm the planet. 
this is where we will bring forth the ideas that we can eliminate nuclear waste through a bacteria and that it does not have to poison our earth. And this is the place, our sacral, that we will birth the way of eliminating the plastic debris that is clogging our earth, our oceans, our rivers and lakes and streams and landfills, the plastic that does not disintegrate. We will birth a way to eliminate that travesty. And now we bring our breath to our sacral and we breathe in to the count of four. Exhale. Again. Exhale. Again. Exhale. And one last time. Exhale. And now we breathe in to the count of eight up our spine. Pause for four. And exhale. And now we bring Helios, our golden sun, into our root. And in our root, we accept the fact that we have the most important function of our day 
that we sometimes forget to do. And that is to connect with the root energy of Mother Earth. The root is, supplies us with 50% of the energy that comes into our body. It is the reason that we can feel solid and safe and secure on the planet because we are grounded. And we ask that, that Helios expand our root and Helios also help the root energy reach the core of Mother Earth and soak up everything that is there because at the core is the same crystalline energy that your cells are made of. One and the same. So as you bring up the root energy, see it in the form of a thousand points of light that sparkle like diamonds and glitter into the root at the base of the spine. And watch as Helios energizes the base and expands the base so that it feels very firm and very solid and so that no matter what happens to you during the day that you cannot be shaken off your foundation. You might experience grief. You might experience sorrow. You may experience exhilaration and joy and peace and love. But no matter what it is, that you experience that your root allows you to stay firm and neutral and that your root keeps you anchored to the energy of Mother Earth. And now we will breathe in to the count of four. And exhale. Again. Exhale. Again. Exhale. And one last time. Exhale. And now for your last breath, take 
the count of eight and go up the spine to the crown. Pause for four. And come down for eight. And now we are going to smooth and seal this energy that we have used with the help of Helios that lives inside of us, the chakras and the subtle bodies. This is our auric field. This is what we are composed of. This is the electromagnetic energy that feeds us, feeds our organs, feeds our, all our systems, feeds our hormones, and everything that we are composed of. So now we are just going to envision the energy of Helios once again and have Helios become a strip of light. And that strip is going to start in your heart. And that strip is going to go above your head to your soul star, come back down to your heart, cross in your heart, Go below your feet. Come back up to your heart. And we are now going to have that strip of light do something different. We are going to have it line up with our chakras. And as it lines up and will go to the soul star, so that's a chakra above our head, and we'll go to the earth star, a chakra below our feet, and we're going to have that strip of light slowly descend from chakra to chakra and as its trail of illumination goes down below our feet, I just want you to visualize that strip opening up in the center like a giant fan. A fan on one side and a giant fan on the other side so that all of your auric field is now filled with the golden light of Helios. And just visualize you radiating as this enormous ball of golden light.
And now we will do one last thing. We will address the matrix. You stand in the middle of a torus, a toric field that could be miles above you, miles to the side of you, miles below you, and then come up through the center of your body. And this toric field is nothing more than grid work. So visualize this toric field and it, the grid work, let's visualize that each grid, even if you go up a mile, that there is a new grid that starts every single inch. So as you visualize the toric field, go up, 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 up around you. It almost feels solid, but it's not. It's filled with illuminating squares. And now take that toric field and bring it back up and just know that should you want to energize your aura and connect to the toric field, you do it through visualization and you can use this or any other meditation that you feel drawn to. I will bring forth other types of meditation as my guides give them to me, but this is what came in for me today. That you start to understand yourself as an energy being that is also connected at every point of intersection between you and another person. And you commingle your energies with that person. But you as an energy being have the right to shine as brightly as you want, as brightly as you need to cope with what it is that is being given to you as the challenge for that day. And I want to assure you that you do have the means to energize yourself fully and completely so that you can be present in a way that you have never been present before. I know that some of you are facing or will face huge challenges in the future. And these challenges are already solved for you. It's just a matter of you getting into that future. We move through our life one second at a time. And it is second by second 
that we can light ourselves up or dim ourselves down through our fear and our anxiety. And so my goal for you is just to give you another technique to light yourself up in a manner that will give you the insight to cope with what it is that you need to face. And I ask, and I'm going to ask that the chakras that were opened and receptive to Helios energy now simply spin in the direction they are supposed to spin in. If you're right-handed, it's clockwise. And that if there is anything else that your chakras need to do, need to feel, need to have, that that also be given to you. And I ask and I thank the angels, the archangels, the ascended masters, but most especially Master Jesus, Master Buddha, Master Katumi, Archangel Metatron, Saint Michael, Saint Raphael, Saint Gabriel, for the healing that has taken place today. I thank you. I bless you. Namaste. Amen. Wow. So glad you made it, Erica. Wow. And uh, hi, Michelle. Um, I'm going to, we have uh, just uh, about nine minutes before we start the, the second half. So let's just do a little bit of feedback, you know, for, for the nine minutes. Um, Michelle, since you've been, I'll, I'll, t I'll come back to you, Erica and Naz last. Uh, Michelle, you've been here. So uh, let's, let's start with you first. Oh, unmute yourself. <laughs> feedback on the healing, you mean? Yes, please. It was good. I mean, I definitely had like just spurts of being overheated here and there. Um, when you get Helios. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, that's, uh, it's interesting because this is the, like the third time he's come in. And uh, I never know when I start the meditation, who's going to show up. I, I just never know. And so that, that to me was uh, interesting that, that he felt uh, that absolutely it was him. So um, that, that he wanted to be here. So anyway, all right, thank you. Uh, James, I think you're up next. So please unmute yourself. Just give us any, any feedback on the healing. Okay, uh, well, maybe James isn't on. Kathy? Key? Okay, Christine? I don't know if they, maybe they can't. I, I really don't understand. They're, they're, they're not unmuting. Um, okay, well. That's uh, uh, Erica. Did you have uh, anything that uh, you wanted to share? 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you. It's just it was beautiful. It was very. I felt very um, restored. Is the word I'm looking for? It was a complete restoration, uh, more of mind, body, soul integration. Something that I feel like I've been kind of lacking over the last few weeks. Not really. Um, I've been meditating. I've been doing everything that I normally do, but this was more like that kind of extra charge, if that makes sense, Sure. that I need it. Mm -hmm. sure. Like a battery boost. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, Naz, how about how about you? Any any comments you'd like to make? Um, it was uh, really relaxing and I enjoyed the grounding. Um, my throat chakra, I kept coughing after we went there, <laughs> like even down one to the third chakra, I felt like there was some stuff that was like blocked there. Um, I probably felt the most energy in my third chakra and my crown. Interesting. Very but nice. uh, yeah, thank okay. you. Thank it was you. great. Thank you. And uh, any whoever is in the background, uh, and there's about 10 of you, uh, if you'd like to make a comment, just unmute yourself because um, nobody is, but they're all there. So. Anyway, unless they, 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 you know, sometimes people need to take a drink. So, uh, this is Sherry. Hi, Sherry. And the feeling that I got when you were doing the band that was going all the way from the star chakra to the um, earth chakra, it was like I was just spinning round and round, <clears throat> um, you know, and with, you know, kind of like in a dress that is just really flowing. And it was just going, and so it was very invigorating. It was really, I enjoyed that. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, we'll, we've got uh, just a few minutes. I'm, um, I'll, I'll be back in five. So uh, I'm just going to mute myself.
Hi there. Your hair is different, Michelle. It's pretty. Unmute yourself. I got it cut a couple weeks ago, so now I get to play with it again. It's back to my my pre-COVID length, which was short. <laughs> oh gosh. So so it's a totally you left this part long? Um well it's short like this on yeah. both sides. It's just uh, in the middle. Oh wow. That so is because how I part it. <laughs> uh-huh. And and the coloring is very pretty. It's that that you've got reddish more reddish highlights, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Whatever box I pick up that week. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> whatever comes in so yeah. anyway wow okay the uh and erica how uh where uh, are you were in the car i think when uh when you called me earlier yes yes i just kept hearing this call alice call alice and i was like oh no you know and i'm glad i did i was thinking about that i was like i wouldn't be connected right now with all of you and thank you and when you talked about, um, you know, then you were going to talk about forgiveness. And I was like, oh, this is just so I mean, like all of this just seems it's always synchronicities. But, you know, perfect timing as always. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, it is. Uh, the spirit comes in and does, you know, gives gives what it wants to. And in, in mm -hmm. my case, I I. I just never ever know. Um, what? Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. I'm I just spent a whole weekend with Elizabeth uh, on on a class with Wanda Lassiter Lundy. So wonderful. Yeah, it it was wonderful, uh, and everything taught us a lot. But uh, anyway, um, Michael, great, yay. And I think that's probably Michael from the class. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yep. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Good evening. Hi there. Welcome. What is the picture behind you? I, I, I'm pretty sure I asked you that before. Is it Chinese? Uh, it's Indian. It's a picture of uh, Krishna um, oh. and frolicking with women and um, it's a traditional painting. Uh, Rodrigo, when he looks at it, he can tell you the whole story. Uh, I bought it in India in 1978, and I've forgotten the whole story. But Rodrigo knows it. He knows so. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's uh, he's wonderful because he's uh, he does some of the traveling still to the same countries overseas. You know, so uh, he's very uh, uh, very adept and uh, everything. So. Okay, um, almost everybody's in the background. Uh, it's been a long day, I think, for a lot of people. So, but uh, today, uh, and I'm I'm going to start because it's uh, 7:32, and um, we have. Today is uh, a presentation on forgiveness. And this is probably, uh, for me, one of the topics that I had to learn the most. Uh, I, I think I came to this planet with that as a mission for myself, is to learn how to forgive. Because I, uh, and, and you will see as the evening unfolds, the, um, the uh, personal examples that I had where I thought I was doing things correctly. I thought I was in the right, but I hurt people in the process. And uh, so... This particular modality, uh, the Hono Ho Pono Pono, is one that I learned of maybe 10, 15 years ago. And over the years, I have 
practiced it at times. It basically has four premises and the and, and it's a very simple prayer. It's a Hawaiian healing and it was originally it came out of a person who sh shared the traditional healing and her name was Morna Simeona and she had she spread the um the healing to the point where she took it overseas she took it to the united nations she took it to johns hopkins university and she had uh, many ways of spreading the message and the words itself ho h o dash o simply means to make ho means to make pono means right so pono pono to make it right to make it right and effectively if you stop to think in order for uh like when i know when i was channeling my first book uh i had a conversation with god and god said to me there's three reasons to come to this planet one of them is to serve your fellow man. The second is to learn to love unconditionally. And the third is to learn to forgive. So if you stop to think about the fact that if you're gonna learn how to forgive, that means things are gonna happen to you that are gonna force you to face whatever issue it is that makes you have have to forgive or make somebody else have to forgive you it's one or the other you know if if this is the planet of forgiveness then there are things that are constantly going to be quote unquote going wrong on this planet that at least in our estimation according to our egos they are going wrong and we are are uh, needing to forgive them and so when uh, uh, Simeona saw the um, you know like when she taught about this this Hawaiian healing and she basically it had four premises and the first one was that you you have to say you have to face directly face confront the person that something happened with and you have to say i am sorry and then the second thing is please forgive me and the third is thank you and the fourth is i love you and this seems simple I mean, as simplistic as anything you've ever heard. And so it just seems really too easy. And the next story that I'm going to tell you about is a Dr. Hugh Lin. And his first name was Ahali Akala, Hugh Lin. He was a clinical psychiatrist and he worked for the, um, the Hawaiian State Hospital and part of the wing, the, the, the specific wing that he worked in was the, for the criminally insane. And it was filled with people who were so God awful that the doctors kept quitting the staff kept quitting. It couldn't keep any nurses. They, they, you know, I mean, the, the turnover was just incredible. And so when, when he was hired to come in to uh, work with these patients, he took this tactic very seriously, but he did something that nobody else had ever done. Instead of 
working with the individual patients and meeting with them the way every other clinical psychiatrist had done. He took each person's file, read it, and asked himself a question. He said, what is it in me that is unhealed that reflects what this person is? And when you stop to think, what does that mean? What is it in me that's unhealed? that reflects what this person is, does, says, thinks. And then he healed that portion inside of him. And he did that with every single patient. And amazingly enough, the people who were on meds came off of medication the people who were violent were no longer violent. The people who uh, they, you know, the, the they were much saner. They were much easier to handle. They 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 literally one by one they healed, and he was able to uh, do nothing more than what I just told you. What is it within me? that is reflected in this person. And I, I mean, if you, like from my standpoint, how many times have I had people that were so um, beaten down by life or beaten down by, uh, the fact that their bosses were so cruel and or somebody in their office was out to get them, just didn't, they couldn't get along with somebody. And what Dr. Hugh Lynn did is he took total responsibility for the other person's illness. And the irony to that is that when you do something like that, when you take total responsibility, it shifts your complete perspective on something. And there is a book out there. I, I know when I read it, it's called The Disappearance of the Universe. And um, if anybody uh, can remember the author, put it in the chat room and I'll publicize it because for the life of me, I cannot remember the author and I didn't have time to Google it. But that's the name of the book is called The Disappearance of the Universe. And I know when I read it, I really started to understand A Course in Miracles better than I had before because uh, I've studied A Course in Miracles since 1995. It's the foundation of my spiritual belief but it also, uh, there is one portion in A Course in Miracles that basically says, God did not create this universe, you did. God did not create this world, you did. And then there are books out there that say, this is a holographic universe and that we are nothing but holograms. And to, interestingly enough, about a month ago, I saw my first hologram. I was sitting there watching TV, not doing anything to, to bring anything on. Not had, and, and I do not drink, so this, you can't attribute it to uh, too much alcohol. But all of a sudden, in front of me is a woman in a, in a kind of a rose-colored lace dress and like, like she's playing in the sand. And she, I saw her for about five seconds. And I saw her long enough to know that, and I could see through her, just the way that you can see through a hologram. So I knew that that wasn't a ghost. Uh, I knew it wasn't a ghost and I knew it was a hologram, you know? And I think that this was spirit's way of just guiding me to, you know, to that uh, thing. But, if 
you want to understand this a little bit further, I, I really um, do encourage you to study the Edgar Casey material because he's the, he is the one author out there that I completely trust that when he channeled universal mind, that he was basically channeling the mind of God. And he brought in information that as far as I was concerned, gave me the, um, uh, the confidence that what I was listening to was true. Just like what Elizabeth and Michael and I yesterday, uh, the last two days, we were in a class and I have complete confidence when I listen to Wanda that what she tells me is true, no matter how out there it is. It doesn't matter, you know. I have complete confidence uh, in, in her that it's true. And that has been um, one of my goals is no matter what I say, that I have the backing of spirit behind me. And uh, otherwise I wouldn't say it. Um, so anyway, um, taking the, uh, taking the, the four, four premises, I am taking the first one. I am sorry. Simple words, very simple words. But if you think back on your lifetime and this is where uh you if any of you really want to do some excavating then i strongly encourage you just to sit down with a journal and uh at, just ask yourself who is still out there that i have not forgiven and what is still out there that I have done that somebody needs to forgive me for. When I did that, I was astonished how many, um, I, would, I would fill up a yellow pad to like two lines. I, I'd make the story very brief, but I would fill up two lines. So who is out there that I have not forgiven and what is out there that I have done that I need to be forgiven for. But I had a fabulous um, example of the words, I am sorry, because there was one time when I had a group of friends that I, they were spiritual friends. And we met weekly to do a Reiki share. There was six of us. And then another 10 of us, and, and some of the six were in, in the group of 10, painted, oh, nine or 10, painted together. So in any given week, I might see them three times because I painted with them weekly. I uh, had Reiki, uh, you know, a Reiki share with them weekly. And then if we did anything else with them, I, you know, was able to meet them. I thought they were friends. I mean, I thought they were true friends because of the fact that up to that point, I had never been challenged for anything that I had written. And for whatever reason, it was, it was in the 90s and this, um, or I should say, starting from the 90s. I was channeling every single day. And this happened in around, I'm going to say 2000. And I know it's after 2010. So uh, at least 11, 12 years ago, somewhere around there. But I brought in my channeled piece for the day. And it had the word dark forces in the channeled piece. Dark forces. I didn't think anything of it. Well, three of, no, actually four. Four of the gals that were of a different political party than, than I have subscribed to 
were livid. They were absolutely livid with me because of the fact that they thought I was labeling their party as having being dark forces. And so they decided to put me on trial. And they, you know, they just, they were going to, they badmouthed me. They, you know, they, they talked about me, they gossiped. I mean, and, and these, like I said, these were people that I had spent up to three days a week with. And uh, interestingly enough, um, I know that as I pulled away from that, that group, I then opened up more to my own spiritual gifts. So I recognized that I felt a need to stay part of the group. And because I wanted to be part of the group, I really didn't want to be any different than they were. But when it, when it was obvious that I had to put a stop to this because uh, the, the, the uh, I guess the emails that were going back and forth were vicious and uh, I had to put a stop for this. So I, I told them that we would have a, a day of reconciliation. Well, but I asked for RSVPs. I asked, you know, for them to, to RSVP. Two of them did not, but they came in anyway. And they breezed in and they were very haughty. And they came in and they sat down at the table. Well, I had prepared my table. And on my table, in the middle, sat a carnelian rock. And this carnelian... If you, you, you can see it a little bit in, in the screen, but it looks like a flame. And in this carnelian, I felt the energy of the goddess Peli. She's the goddess of Hawaii and she's a fire goddess. And she is very protective of the Hawaiian people. And if necessary, she will cause a tidal wave to come in. If she thinks something is happening that is uh, hurting her people, she will, she'll, she'll start a forest fire. She'll, you know, come in and do a tidal wave. She's, she's really incredible. Well, I put this carnelian in the middle and then next to it, I put a whole series of quartz, clear quartz going down the table. And I, I literally could feel the protection from those crystals. And the whole time, three hours, that they were throwing accusations at me, I sat there and I just looked at them. I didn't say anything. I didn't feel the need to say anything. I just looked at them. And interestingly enough, afterwards, and at one point, one of the gals across the table, one of the two that breezed in without a, um, you know, without a thing, gave me the raspberries. And then I started to keep track of what they were saying that was not true. And so I just started to write that down. And I thought, oh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty independent person and, and I'm fortunate uh, at that point uh, to, have had a career where I really didn't have a boss per se, because my husband was my boss, but I did all my own work myself in real estate. And so in my spiritual work, I'm totally, I mean, Wanda, I would never consider her a boss. She was my teacher. She was my mentor. She was a person I turned to, but I never had anybody breathing down my neck. I never had anybody uh, correcting me. Or, or, or saying nasty things to me. So this just absolutely astonished me. It was like, I, I guess I kept thinking, oh, so this is what other people go through. This, I mean, this is what it feels like. This is what other people go through. But after they left, after the three of them stayed behind and uh, the two that breezed in left, and three, three others stayed behind and they kept trying to cajole me and get information out of me or, or something out of me. Finally, all the one, one faction left, 
a couple more uh, stayed behind and she and one of them said to me, Alice, didn't you get it? And I said, get what? She said, they wanted you to say, I'm sorry. And I looked at the gal and I said, I'm not sorry. Why would I say that? Because I wasn't sorry. So effectively, I learned something so valuable that day. Obviously, those people are not friends anymore. That, that, that part of my life absolutely ended. Uh, at that time, I uh, no longer had this this uh, group that I met with three times a week. Um, but I learned that if I truly am sorry about something, I will say it. I will be the first to say it. But if I'm not sorry, I'm not going to say it just because somebody else wants to hear it. So I... I'm not exactly sure what the uh, the thing is, but I was really what what the lesson was for me from that, except that that I had no remorse for writing what I did. I had no remorse for uh, anything that um, um, uh, that happened. And frankly, I had no remorse literally for losing the friends that I had because they weren't friends. They ended up putting their politics in front of the friendship. And if that's what they did, and I think we've seen that happen over and over and over and over, uh, you know, in these last couple of years. So I know that uh, you, you just have to uh, say, what it is that you truly feel. And if I had truly felt sorry for getting them all riled up, but I wasn't gonna take responsibility for their response. I felt that was theirs. They had to own it. It wasn't mine. And uh, anyway, I, it, I'd be curious, uh, you know, I've, I've never asked anybody, well, what do you think, you know? Should should I have said anything different? But if you have any comments that, that you want to leave me in the chat box, I'm, I'm more than happy to listen to them and everything. So anyway, that, that was my experience with the words, I am sorry. And I know positively that when I did my list of things that I that others have to forgive me for, I was flabbergasted and I knew that I had to then go to certain people and apologize for things that I had done um, and everything. So portion number two, please forgive me. That's portion number two. And I got a fabulous example of please forgive me from the in in 1987 roughly when i took a program called the forum and the forum was a throwback to est and from the 70s and this was like 1987 they had gone on and uh, so this was the first of about a, a string of maybe four or five programs but um they concentrated on the words, please forgive me. And it was interesting because when I was at the forum, first of all, I had to, um, the group met, um, I'm going to say about seven miles away. So seven miles isn't that far, but nevertheless, I had to get there. We had to start at eight o'clock in the morning and we worked until one o'clock in the morning. So, and then we got a half hour for dinner, a half hour for lunch, and like two 15 minute breaks. And that was it. So it was like, it was really intense work. And uh, you, you were just, you, you literally felt like you were being bombarded with mental pressure, but they 
one of the things that he um, that that came out in and please forgive me was that they said that if there's anybody in your life that you have to get forgiveness from, you're going to have to get it before class the next morning. So I'm thinking, oh, I'm coming home. It's 1.30 in the morning or 1.15, you know, in the morning. And I have to be back here. So somewhere be before seven o'clock in the morning, I have to talk. And, and I knew there were the three people I had to talk to, my mom, my dad, and my husband. And with my husband, I had maintained a, um, an attitude. We had different management styles. And when we ran a small business together, we ran a property management company and a real estate company. My attitude was, you're doing it wrong. You're wrong. There was no meeting of the minds. There was no even questioning that could, could we sit down and talk about this? It's just, you're wrong. And so as a result, there were, when we got in, when I got angry about something, my reaction was so predictable. I would go into a rage. I would be given the silent treatment for three days and then I'd be fine. So he knew that every time I went into a rage, it, it, it would follow with three days of silence and then I'd, I'd be fine. I'd be back. I'd be, I'd be normal. Ridiculous. But it's the way at that point that I worked. I, that it's the way I functioned. And I didn't know better. So I sat down with him and I figured the, the best thing I can do is just write out what it is that, you know, how many times I've insulted him, how many times I've uh, said something to undermine his authority, how many, you know, whatever, 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 and everything, and, and, and give him this and kind of like read it to him really fast. And he looked at me, he says, you really, you have nothing, uh, I don't feel you've done anything. And I don't know where this is coming from. So I explained to him that I felt that that this was wrong. In his estimation, he reacts in a manner that when he doesn't like something, he just blows up and he'll say whatever comes out of his mouth. It doesn't matter if it's hurtful or hateful or, or obscene or anything. He just says it. But then once it's gone, it's gone. He doesn't hold on to anything where I held on and I went into a rage and into a funk. And so effectively, it was that taught me that two different management styles can be at crosshairs and really wreak havoc. And the fact that our marriage didn't dissolve during most of that period of our life was because he truly loved me. That's, that's all I can say. He truly, that man truly loved me. And, um, and so he, to, to him, it's like, oh, that's just Alice being Alice. And I, I looked at that and I thought, well, that's, that's a very kind, loving gesture as far as I was concerned. It was very kind and very loving. But the mother and father that I had to get uh, forgiveness from, they were both in spirit. They had both died. In the uh, my mother uh, in 1981, five days before my baby was born, and my father in 1987, he died the same day Ethel Ford died. And so I wondered, I said, okay, well, how, and I asked the instructor, how am I going to get forgiveness from people that are in spirit? And then he said, call them in. And if you can just see them in your mind's eye for 30 seconds, just know you've connected. And frankly, if you can see them for five seconds, you've connected, you know, uh, you don't have to wait for 30 seconds. But if you need to ask for forgiveness, from a being who is in spirit, just know that when you call them in, they're there. They're right next to you. 
because that's been proven to me time and time and time again. So you don't have to wait for any certain time. And with both of my parents, what I needed first and foremost to ask for forgiveness was, um, you know, I, I needed to say, please forgive me for the fact that I, my first husband, I met and married a man that I only knew three weeks before I married him. And they begged me not to, but they weren't of the kind, they weren't the kind of people that felt that they could, um, uh, like, I, I told my daughter, I said, should you call me up and tell me you're going to do something like I did, that that was totally insane. I'm going to just hop on a plane and get to where you are as fast as I possibly can and everything. So, uh, and, the, and the irony to her story is she's finally getting married this August. She'll be 40. So, I, uh, I, I loved the fact that uh, it, maybe I scared her a little bit too much, but she thought very, very carefully about who it was that she was going to marry, because effectively that single act on my part literally was a crucifixion for both of my parents. And it was one of the most hurtful, hateful acts that I could have ever done without even realizing that it was hurtful and hateful. And my excuse was, I love him, which was nonsense because I didn't have a clue what love meant. And it just so happened that, you know, it, everything worked out that I was married within 24 hours. And uh, this was in a, a resort town in Vermont. And uh, I didn't even, frankly, didn't even know how I got there. So I had to ask for forgiveness for, from both parents. And by keeping the image of each one separate, you know, at first my dad, then my mom, I was able to get the words out, please forgive me. And it was wonderful that I heard the word, and in Polish, tak means yes. So I heard the words tuck and from each of them. And I knew that, that, that I had gotten through to them, but it, it was amazing to me that, uh, that how much of a burden that had placed on my soul that I hadn't even realized that I was carrying. So anyway, third thing, thank you. And there's a, a wonderful story of, um, I know it doesn't, I, I don't know if it exists anymore, actually. It's called Success Magazine, but it was around in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, um, maybe in the 2000s. Og Mandini was a um, uh, editor of Success Magazine. And he had, uh, he wrote wonderful books, small, very, very small. And at that point, they were all paperback. And they, if I remember correctly, they all cost $7.95. You know, they, they weren't expensive. And one of the books was called The Greatest Salesman in the World. And it was about Jesus and his apostles. And then he kind of made the statement of how hard it must have been for Jesus to have convinced this ragtag group of, of men to follow the teachings that he was a proponent of. And so Og himself apparently led a pretty exemplary life, at least according to what his son saw. And his son, uh, Almost, I think, at the uh, at somewhere around age 15, decided that he was on the verge of suicide. He just didn't want to live anymore. And something triggered him confessing it to the father. And the father, and, and he basically, uh, the, uh, Og's son said to him, 
dad, you're not going to understand. You've never had anything go wrong in your life. You've never done anything wrong. You've never had anything go wrong. And Og said, to, he, he kind of like stopped him in his tracks. And he said, let me tell you something. When I was 15, which is almost the same age his son was at, the, at this point, I got a gun with the intention of committing suicide, with the intention of blowing my, you know, uh, like, like just blowing my brains out. The only problem is I didn't have the guts to do it. So I didn't do it. And I know that the same exact thing happened to me because my first marriage put me into such a place of despair that I literally didn't care if I lived or died. I, at just before we moved to Virginia, which was our, our last, our, this was our 10th move in five years. We weren't military. And every single time we moved, we wasted a whole ton of money. And then, uh, uh, but anyway, um, the, when this was, this was our last move, uh, our, our prior to our last move was New Jersey. And I can remember I'm barely 27 and I step in front of a car. I step off the curb and he yanks me back, you know, and chances are that car could have killed me. Uh, had I, you know, or, or seriously injured me, but uh, I, I, I suspected that it could have killed me. And all I could say was thank you to him. And all Og's son said to his father, after the father admitted that, yes, I too was in a place of despair and, but didn't even have the guts to pull the trigger. So I got rid of the gun. And uh, then, then, uh, and, and things just started to improve. But in my case, the last move that we made uh, when my first husband told me we're moving to Virginia, I gave him an ultimatum and I said, fine, I'm gonna move to Virginia, I'm gonna live in Virginia and I'm gonna die in Virginia. And that, that was my ultimatum to him. And effectively what happened, totally predictable, Within three months, he said, we're moving back to New York. And I said, you're moving back to New York. I'm staying. And that's uh, by, by then I had found my way into a career in real estate. And it was in real estate that I met the man who became my second husband. And when I stopped to think of what I would have missed had I... Um, a, a life that unfolded, that ended at 27 because I was so miserable. And I know that there are children out there that are committing suicide. Children, because they're in such states of despair. And the, the sad thing is that we just have to monitor our feelings and do what Ever it takes to bring us out, to bring us up, to bring us to fullness, to wholeness, to uh, everything. And and uh, it's interesting what you said, Erica, that you had, you you did meditation, you you know, and everything. But yet this this added a different type, maybe texture or dimension or or something to to you know what you experience normally. So, and I I just. To me, I, when I think back on the fact that I would have missed a whole life had I just gotten away with ending it at age 27, you know, it, it just boggles my mind. But the power of thank you is living in an attitude of gratitude. And my, one of my favorite quotes in the whole world comes from a 13th century monk. And his name was Meister Eckhart. 
And I always feel, I wonder if Eckhart Tolle is a, um, uh, if that was one of the past lives of Eckhart Tolle because it's the same name. But Meister Eckhart was a 13th century monk. And um, there was a little cartoon in Mutz um, that came out, I don't know, 10 years ago, but it's still on my refrigerator. And it said, if the only thing you say is thank you, that is enough. That is enough. And to me, that is so important. Just saying thank you, living your life with an attitude of gratitude. And in this case, what did Dr. Hugh Lin say thank you for? The relief of the feelings that the per that the person was holding on to that were causing them the illness. So he said, just thank you to that. And then the last one is, I love you. And effectively, love is all there is. And is I, I know, is, is that a Beatles song? Did, did anybody know? Is it, or something like it? I know, yeah, I know it's, yeah, it's, it's in one of the Beatles songs. Is love is all there is? is it, it, I don't, I, love is all I you know need. That that, love is all you need? Yeah, love, love is, is all, you, all need. you need. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And in the Course in Miracles, A Course in Miracles, which is the foundation of my spiritual studies, there is a saying that says, you do, you, you, can do, or no, I'm sorry, you have to do, either you can do nothing or you have to do nothing. And I think that you can do nothing except offer the Holy Spirit a little willingness. Just say, turn it over to the Holy Spirit. Turn it over to the, um, the people that that don't want to um, be uh, the, the people, the, the beings in spirit that are here to help you. And what is the Holy Spirit? The voice for God that reaches down through the ethers to us. And that voice for God lives inside of us because that voice for God is us. So effectively, the, the beauty is that when you add, when you kind of seal this with, I love you, you have sealed it in a manner that just brings you to a, um, to a wholeness, a fullness and a beautiful place that just doesn't, um, Well, I don't, doesn't need any more explanation. Doesn't, you know, you're, you're just there. You're just, uh, you're finished. And you've chosen, I mean, you've fit in to the space that you uh, had. So, and the, only last thing that I wanted to say is eventually you're going to get to a place where you're going to realize there is nothing to forgive because you had a say in everything that happens to you. Because when you were in spirit, you were given a movie screen projection of the major junctions of your life that your council of 12, which your higher self is part of that council of 12, they're the ones that help you decide from lifetime to lifetime what it is that's gonna happen to you. You had a choice in it and then you're given a movie screen projection of it and then you're, you're asked, do you agree to that life? And you say yay or nay. And if you say yay, then you come down to the birth canal. And the minor junctions are 
all free will. So there's no such thing as predestinate, you know, predestination that this, this is going to happen to you no matter what. That's, that doesn't exist because there are certain religions that, that feel that you have no say whatsoever. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to be a good person. You're going to be a bad person. You're going to be a drug you're going to be a thief. You're, you know, it's, it's all predestined. And that's not the case at all. You can change every single thing on a dime with your thoughts and, and change it instantly. Um, let's see anything else here. Options. Oh, your other options, obviously. You can hold on to grudges. You can hold on to pain. You can hold on to rage, to resentment, to everything that makes you feel bad. It's a choice. And if you don't hold on, then in letting that go, then this, to me, these, the, these four statements are a, such a simple way of bringing you back. I am sorry, please forgive me. Thank you, I love you. So anyway, I don't know what time it is. Ah, it's very early, um, but uh, let's see if there's anything else. Um, Oh yeah, there was one, one more thing that I wanted to cover is effectively when Dr. Hugh Lin worked with these patients and there is a faction out there that says that he, that this never happened, that there are people that just absolutely do not believe that this ever happened. And uh, in fact, I read one comment today as uh, you know, that came off the website that said like, what hospital would be willing to allow a psychiatric um, doctor to never have a single treatment with a patient? And to me, it's like, I know people who claim the Holocaust never happened. I was born in Poland. My father was one of those people who was asked to load bodies from that had been heaped up that, that you know, load them that for wherever they were going to burn piles or, or wherever. So uh, I, you know, and I know that when I went the first time that I went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, um, one of the very, very first pictures that you're going to come to is the, the people as they were freed. Uh, and I think it was Dwight Eisenhower that took the pictures, or at least he's credited on the, the board with one of his statements. And he said, I want these pictures documented so that the world never forgets that this existed. And yet there are people that say the Holocaust never happened. I mean, there are people that are, are look at what they're doing with uh, the January 6th insurrection of uh, the, um, the thing. They're blaming another whole faction for it. So public opinion, I, I really don't put much faith in public opinion because what happens can be distorted and distorted and distorted. So anyway, I, I truly feel that this is a, it's a very simple little technique, but it's one that can be extremely effective. And um, I, I do thank you, you know, for uh, this. I, I know it's shorter, but um, I think I covered everything I needed to cover, unless you gals, anybody has some questions. Yeah, so anyway, or statements of unbelief or disbelief. Michelle. <laughs> um, 
I've been using Ho'oponopono for like three years now. I use it for a couple of different things. Um, one of the things is when I get those negative thoughts that pop in your head when you start like creating scenarios and stories that aren't likely to happen, but you're getting all agitated and worked up about it. When that stuff shows up in my head, I just keep re re repeating these phrases again and again and again. Um, and it causes those thoughts to go away and it kind of changes me from like a low vibration into a higher vibration. Um, I also use it to get rid of hiccups. <laughs> hiccups? Hiccups. <laughs> wow. I don't know why. I, I think it's because, I mean, these are like um, high vibrational words. So I mean, if you're in a low vibration and you need brought up, a you know, yeah, um, I use it for that. But there's meditations on YouTube for Ho'oponopono. And there's one that um, it kind of um, goes to your like inner child where you're kind of addressing that and forgiving your your inner child for things. And it's I think it's like a half hour long. But I mean, I can't make it through that one without like crying and releasing a lot. So sure. um, it, it definitely works if you're, you know, need something to kind of help get you out of those low spells or, you know, to kind of help clear some things. Yeah. And if anybody, again, wants the, uh, my uh, secretary, Donna, I didn't do the, the screen share. I didn't feel it was necessary. Um, but if you want her research, I'll be glad to email it to you. You know, so just again, in the chat room, you can leave me an email if you want it. And uh, she'll, she works for me on Thursday. So when I say I'll email it, she'll email it on Thursday, you know. Uh, but uh, anyway, but that, Michelle, that was fantastic. Thank you. I, uh, because again, uh, oh, and, and I just did want to ask you a question. What, what causes a hiccup? Because my, got, my grandson is hiccuping a lot and he's, he's not even five. So what, what causes a hiccup? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Okay. All right. Um, well, let's. Uh, I have let's... a question. Sure. This is Kathy. Um, Hi, Kathy. Where did you get your um, acquaintance or connection with these ascended masters? Is that okay to ask? Oh, of course, yeah. Uh, in my case, I heard sure, voices, yeah. yeah uh, I heard voices from the time I was eight, and those voices were always giving me instruction on how to do my homework or how to do something, accomplish something better. If I was in a, if I was doing a sewing project. Uh, by, uh, I think, gosh, I, I know I started sewing in sixth grade. By the time I was in 10th grade, I was actually sewing business suits. And there were some pretty complicated um, things that you had to do on the Butterick and Vogue patterns. And um, then I would hear just this download, but I never really credited it with guides. It was only after I started learning about energy healing that I realized that, oh, these are beings talking to me because uh, for the most part in the 90s, I would be awakened um, from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. And I'd have to, to come downstairs, sit down at the computer and start typing and giving, uh, you know, whatever it was that they were telling me until they were done. And then when they were done, it would, it, it's like the, my, the screen inside my head went go, bzzz, like the end of a broadcast day. So I know that they were finished. I, I've got, I, I filled up 15 yellow pads of the, uh, the words that, that all, the stories that all ended up in my book, Own Your Power. And, uh, that's that's this one and so I wrote that through and the reason that I wrote consistently was because I had broken my wrist I broke my left wrist so my right hand was free 
and I refused to take pain medication. And all I could do was sit and write. That's the, the only thing that, that was available to me. So I, I ended up with 15 yellow pads. And then I was told at the end of that period that your book is done. And I said, it is? I thought I hadn't even started. And then I realized, oh, everything I had put in there, but it was just the start. Every, you know, every day's meditation. In some cases, it was a full day's meditation, but in other cases, it had to be expanded and edited and re-edited and re-edited. So anyway, it's, it's been a really long process, Kathy, for me, but um, I, I, any, every single person is guided and every single person can learn how to bring the messages of their guides by channeling, by sitting down with a piece, uh, with a paper and pencil. And I recommend a uh, composition notebook, a spiral bound notebook, or a, you know, so something that's bound. Uh, can be fancy if you want, can be plain, doesn't matter. But if you can do it at the same time every day, sit and take down the messages that come into you. And then after 30 days of doing that, ask who's talking to you. And if you've never had this type of, of uh, if you've never done anything like this, then I recommend doing something for 60 days prior to this. And this, is, this comes from Julia Cameron. Uh, she's the author of The Artist Way. And she was Martin Scorsese's second wife. And she says, write three pages a day, every single day. And that's you, you, where you just empty your mind. So write anything that comes to you and then go into write on purpose. Because after, let's say, writing three pages a day for 60 days, I will tell uh, the student, a serious student, that they are not to reread what they have written for until the end of the 60 days. And so now they're going to reread 180 pages in one sitting, but they're going to reread it with a highlighter because every single time as they're rereading it, they will come to a passage where they know, oh my gosh, this message didn't come from me. It came through me. And they'll recognize that because they're because you're doing it all at the same time. I I I hope that makes sense to you, Kathy. Uh yeah, I guess I, I see what you're saying. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right, then let's uh, start with our prayer. And uh today, and I'm going to repeat the whole list of, of things that came through me for the healing session this morning. Um, in a sense, it was almost heartbreaking, but because it, it kind of like shows you what the state of the earth is. But um, anyway, uh, let's start with that. So if you very gently close your eyes, Take a deep breath in, exhale. Dear Mother, Father, God, divine infinite spirit, source of all that is, I ask to be connected to you, to my higher self and to the higher self of Mother Earth. I ask for the assistance of the angels, the archangels, the ascended masters, the Reiki masters. And I ask for special healing for the following. And this woman came in on our prayer list. Her name is Verna Lewin, and she asked for healing for her physical body. And what my guides asked me to say was for all those who are starting a new life together in marriage. For all those who are ending their life, who are actually cutting the silver cord as they leave the planet. 
for all the new babies coming down the birth canal, the new life that is coming. For all those people that are caught in the crosshairs of groups that are battling each other. For all of those who are caught in the web of deceit, the deceit that dictators bring forward. For all those who are fleeing a life of persecution and for all the refugees who are trying to come to a new place of existence, especially the United States. And Michelle. I'd like to send prayers to anyone who's struggling with depression or is struggling with COVID um, as well as through my family. Thank you, Erica. I'd like to send prayers to all those who are opening up to find and accept and live out their soul's purpose for this lifetime. Good. Thank you. Elizabeth. I would like to offer prayers for all of us in this group, for all of humanity, for the entire animal kingdom, Mother Earth, and for my extended family and my family, my husband, my sons, Christopher and Michael. Thank you. Thank you. And Michael. My sisters, Patty and Judy, my brother-in-law, Tom, and for Jennifer. Thank you. And those on the side, uh, if you would unmute yourself, if you'd like to talk, Sherry. Um, I'd like to ask for prayers and sending prayers to my grandson who is dealing with depression and his family and how to work with the situation when he comes home and to the planet Earth that just needs help so desperately. Thank you. Okay, great. And Christine. I would like to ask for healing for my family, for um myself for Cricket and McKinley, as well as my dream team and um, Gaia and everyone here tonight. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, and okay, no one else unmuted. So, all right, and we will have you, um, let's see, who's on next week? Roz Kincaid is the gal who's on next week. She is the uh, person that has a radio station and she always brings forth something uh, rather interesting. And then she's one of our paid speakers. So uh, we do suggest a donation of $25. Again, pay it if you can. So I, I thank you for being here and um, just hope to see you next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Many blessings to you all. Bye bye. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Alice. you, Alice. This was great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. Michelle. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye bye, bye Alice. Bye bye, Christine. Yes.